Okay, thank you. We we're just setting up our YouTube simulcast. Um, we are casting over there. Um, so if any of our attendees today are having any difficulties, uh, those being members of the public watching this stream, you could always go to our YouTube channel um, and watch from there. Uh, the only catch is if you want to make a public comment, you'll, you'll have to be within the Zoom platform to do that. Okay, well, Mr. Chairman, we are now recording and streaming. So we are ready to begin uh, when you are. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I would like to call to order this meeting of the Transportation Systems Management and Operations Committee, the TISMO Committee. This is a virtual meeting and we appreciate you joining us. We have a team of hosts who are present to ensure that we have a smooth meeting today. Before we proceed with the agenda, I would like to remind the public we are operating under emergency orders from the federal, state, and local governments to conduct public meetings in a responsible manner due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The committee is meeting through a virtual meeting room to comply with our civic responsibility. To ensure public participation and transparency, we have taken several steps. This meeting is taking place on the Zoom platform and information on how the public can participate was advertised in advance of the meeting on the Metro Plan Orlando website, social media, as well as through targeted emails. The virtual meeting is accessible to the public by computer or by phone. The meeting is being simulcast on Metro Plan Orlando's YouTube channel and will be recorded and posted on the YouTube channel within a week. A link to that recording will be available at the metroplanorlando.org under achieved meeting, or, sorry, archived meeting materials. Florida Sunshine Law typically requires a quorum to be physically present in a room for a government meeting. However, Governor Ron DeSantis has suspended the requirement in an executive order issued in March, allowing government organizations to continue business using remote meetings. Other Sunshine Law requirements still apply and Metroplan Orlando is acting to ensure that these are followed. Before we go any further, I would like to review our virtual meeting guidelines, which should help us to have an orderly flow to the business of our meeting. We have a short video that explains these. Welcome to Metro Plan Orlando's virtual meeting. Here are some things you should know. Board and committee members are active participants and members of the public are observers. Our chairperson will make sure to keep the meeting flowing. Please keep your microphone or phone line muted unless recognized to speak. Make sure to pay attention to your video controls as well. Participants are welcome to use the raise hand feature to ask questions after presentations. This feature can be found when clicking on the participants icon. When recognized by the chair to speak, the host will unmute your microphone. Please make sure to speak clearly so everyone can hear you. You may also submit questions via the chat box by clicking on the chat icon. A moderator will relay your question. Thank you. So to recap, please keep your microphones muted unless you have been recognized. We will use the raise hand functions for members to participate in the discussion. Now some information about public comments. Just as with our on-site meetings, the members of this committee are considered active participants. Members of the public are welcome and will largely be observers. We have two public comment points in the meeting, and these are the only times the members of the public will be recognized. To be recognized to speak, members of the public will use the raise hands feature if attending by computer, and their mic will be temporarily unmuted by staff. If you're attending by phone, the tape, um, sorry, if you're attending by phone, please hit star nine to raise your hands to be recognized. We will ask you to state your name and your contact information for the record. There are two ways outside the live meeting to contribute your public comments by email or through a phone message before the meeting. The methods for the public comment are posted at metroplanorlando.org slash virtual meetings. Public comments received before the meeting will be read by the staff at the conclusion of the meeting. We want this online meeting to be accessible to all. Participants may join by computer, tablet, or phone. However, if you need accommodations to take part in this meeting, 
please use the raise hand feature located under participants tab at the bottom of your screen to get help from a moderator. At this time, I'd like to recognize Eric Hill, who will be taking care of calling attendance in the agenda review. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning uh, to you and to our members uh, who are joining us virtually. Uh, thank you for working with us during this transition to virtual meetings. We remain dedicated to having good, stuff, good discussions about transportation planning in Central Florida. We are doing our best in this environment to stay transparent and accessible to the public. We appreciate your patience and understanding. As the chair mentioned, we will be using the raised hand feature to recognize committee members during the meeting, as well as to call on members of the public during the comment time. If you have joined us on the phone only without the video screen, please use star six to mute and unmute your line. Please use star nine to raise your virtual hand so that the meeting host can see that you wish to be recognized. And Mr. Chairman, if it pleases you, I'd like to move on to the next item on the agenda, which is confirmation of quorum. Yes, please proceed. Okay, thank you. At this time, I'd also like to call the roll for committee members so that we can confirm a quorum for this meeting. Please take a moment to unmute your mic at this time. When you or your organization is called, please say present for the record. After the roll is called, please mute your mic again, and I'll do a quick agenda review. So starting uh, with the roll call, Brett Blackadar, City of Altamont. I am present. Benton Bonnie, City of Orlando. Present. Kay Broad, City of Orlando. Kelly Brock, City of Cassaberry. Present. Scott Brown, City of Windermere. Present. Okay, you, you're, you're with us, Scott. Yeah, I'm here. I'm okay. sorry. I'm okay. muting. Okay. Michael Cass, City of Sanford. I'm present. Crystal Clem, City of Lake Berry. Present. Hazen Alazar, Orange County. Present. Brad Phil, Goa. Nassim Gandora, City of St. Cloud. Present. Eric Gordon, Florida Turnpike Enterprise. Yeah, good morning, uh, present. Glenn Hammer. Osceola Public Schools. Brian Homayani, Central Florida Expressway. Present. Doug Jamison, Lynx. Present. Gene Dredge, Seminole County. Present. Carl Kelly, University of Central Florida. Present. Steve Krug, City of Ocoee. Alex Laffey, Osceola County. Present. Kathy Lee, Osceola County. Don McCoat, City of Winter Park. Present. Which McGrath, MPO appointee. Present. <clears throat> Present. Lieutenant Brad McDaniel, Seminole County Sheriff. Nabil Muhasin, City of Kissimmee. Present. Lee Poland, Reedy Creek Improvement District. Present. Pam Richmond, City of Apopka. Brian Sanders, Orange County. Present. Christopher Smith, City of Winter Springs. Rachel Gerinella, present for Chris Schmidt. Thank you. 
Ramon Sinorans, Kissimmee Airport. I'm present. Chad Smith, City of Longwood. Present. Kimberly Tracy, City of Maitland. Charlie Wetzel, Seminole County. Present. Okay, Mr. Chairman, if it pleases you, I would like to move on to the next item, which is agenda review, staff follow-up. Mr. Hill, do we have a quorum? Uh, yes, we do have a quorum. Okay, please okay. proceed. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> we will be sending a survey after this meeting. So that hey, Eric. Yes. Excuse me, this is Kathy Lee. I didn't hear my name mentioned, but I am present as well. Okay, I, I did call you, so thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We will be sending a survey after this meeting so you can tell us about your virtual meeting experience. Let us know how to make these meetings better. Today's agenda is available at metroplanorlando.org in the calendar and meeting materials section. We have streamlined the agenda to deal with action items the most crucial information presentations. We have four action items on the agenda today. After each presentation on action item, the chair will ask for a motion in a second. We will ask members to unmute their microphones at that time. State your name for the record when making a motion or seconding it. After we have a motion in second, the chair will recognize any committee member who raises a hand or a question or comment. Please make sure your mic is unmuted when we take a voice vote on the motion. Currently, uh, Mr. Chairman, we are ready to proceed with the agenda and we do have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Hill. You're welcome. We'll now hear public comments on today's action items. Do we have people who want to speak on any action items? If so, please use the raise hands function found at the bottom of your screen by, or by pressing star nine on your phone keypad. When we call on you, you will be unmuted and you will see a button pop up that says the host wants to unmute you. Accept that prompt to activate your microphone. We do ask that you provide your name and address for the record and please hold your comments to two minutes or less. Are there any comments being requested at this time? Uh, we do not have any, uh, Mr. Chairman. And are there any written comments that were submitted prior to the meeting? We have not received any. And with that, then we will move on to our action items. As a reminder, we will present each action item and then invite questions or comments from committee members only. If you have a question or a comment, please use the hands, the raise hands feature, which is found as an option under participants tab at the bottom of your screen. When you are recognized, you can then unmute yourself. You may also submit questions via the chat button at the bottom of the window and a moderator will relay your questions. The chat feature communicates with all panelists in this meeting, which includes committee members, staff, and the group centers. Please remember that a full record of the chat comments will be included with the public record of this meeting. So our first action item is the approval of the February 28, 2020 meeting minutes found in tab one of your agenda. I hope you've had a chance to read through these meetings or through these minutes. We'll now temporarily unmute everybody's microphones and we'll ask for a motion and a second. Please remember to state your name before speaking. Do I have a motion for approval? Motion to approve, Hazem al -Assar. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second, Shad Smith. Have first and a uh, motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? Please remember to raise hands if you do. And having none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> any opposed? And hearing none, motion passes. Our second and Action item is the approval of the FDOC amendment to the FY 2019, 20 through 2023 20, and 24 tip. Mr. Keith Kasky will present the information. 
Mr. Keith Kasky from Metro Plan Orlando staff is requesting the TISMO to recommend that the FY 2019-20 through 23-24 TIP be amended to include a links project, Southwest Orlando bicycle and pedestrian study, an access management project for State Road 50, traffic signals at US 441 and Clarcona Coe Road, and an interchange modification at I-4 and County Road 532. A letter from FDOT explaining the amendment request is in tab two of our agenda, along with the fact sheet that will be presented to the Metro Plan or, uh, Board on May 13th at their meeting. Please hold your questions on this action item until the presentation is finished. Then committee members will be able to raise their hands and I'll recognize you at that time. Ms. Burkowski. Okay, well, good, yeah. Yeah, good morning. Um, I think uh, the chairman covered this item pretty well. Uh, we do have five uh, projects uh, in this amendment request and you all have the information on the screen and also in your packets. So uh, unless there's any questions, uh, we're asking for your approval of the amendment. So I'll ask the committee if there's any questions, please raise your hand. Awesome. I see your hand yes, raised. Mr. Chairman, I have a question about uh, the project at US 441 and Claracona Coe. Is there any more details on that project? I don't have any specific details. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a mast arm or uh, I just know it's a, it's a, uh, a traffic signal improvement at that intersection. I think this, the signals there now are just hanging from wires. So I, I'm not sure if it's a mast arm or what exactly is going in there, but, but it is an improvement to what's the, the um, signals that are there at the, currently. So can you find out the details on said after the meeting? Uh, yes, I can check with FDOT and, and send you the information. Thank you. Alex, you have a question? Alex Levy? Yes, sir. Uh, on that same item, our director was concerned about um, the high cost of design for that signal. Is the 310000 just for the design, or does that include some construction as well? I believe that's just for the design. Noted. Thank you. Shows Brian and Renzo. So I'm not sure which of the two of you, but you're you're on. Could uh, you? Can you hear me? Yes. Could you give us a little more information on the Southwest Orlando bicycle and pedestrian study? Uh, the only information I have is uh, that provided by DOT. It just covers the area. Uh, in Southwest Orlando from Sand Lake Road up to State Road 408. Um, I don't know if anyone from the city of Orlando has any more information on that. Uh, that's all the information I have. Is there a representative from FDOT? Do we have somebody from city of Orlando or FDOT who would like to address? Yeah, Anna's still in name today for Rakinia. Um, you're asking about the Southwest Orlando bicycle and pedestrian study? That's correct. Um, let me see if I can get you an answer on that. I, I don't have that in front of me. I apologize. Benton Bonnie, you have a question? Uh, several questions. Yeah, um, Orlando would like to know about the uh, the bicycle study it, it may be our bike ped group uh, but I don't know about it and the uh, let me see the two hundred fifty thousand dollars for the safe corridor management project on State Road fifty from Pine Hills to Tampa um, I'd like some more information on that one and um, the uh, the Claricona Ocoee while Orange County maintains a signal we time it so. Um, I'd like to get information on that signal as well, that signal as well, and we would like to be involved in the design process. Yeah, on the access management project on State Road 50, uh, I do have the uh, project scope from FDOT, and I can send that out to everybody. Is, is that in um, CFL Roads or CF Roads? Or yeah, if you could send that to me, I'd appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> 
This is Brian. I'd like to re request this information before the board meeting, please. Mr. Kasky will be able to comply on that one. Yes. Okay. Anyone else on discussion? Do we have a motion? Motion to approve, Hazem al -Sar. Thank you, Hazem. Do we have a second? Nabil Mohajan, second. Thank you, Nabil. Any further discussion? Go ahead and call the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. And we have a nay because of the forum we're on. We will do a roll call vote. Mr. Hill. Okay. Brett Black and R. Yes. Benton Bonnie. Yes. Kate Broad, it's not here. Actually, uh, sorry, Eric, I joined a little late, so I don't okay. know if I'm still part of the quorum to vote. Yes. So, uh, Kate? Yes. <laughs> uh, Kelly Brock? Yes. Scott Brown? Yes. Michael Cash? Yes. Crystal Clem? Yes. Hazem Alazar? Yes. Bradfield is not with us. Nassim God, God, Gandiar? Yes. Eric Gordon? Uh, yes. Ben Hammer is not with us. Brian Homayani? Yes. Doug Jamison? Yes. Gene Drudge? Gene Drudge? Carl Kelly? Yes. Steve Krug? Oh, he's not with us. Alex Laffey? Yes. Kathy Lee. Yes. Doug Marcotti. Yes. Butch, Butch McGrath. Yes. Yes. Uh, Lieutenant uh, Brad McDaniel is not with us. Nabil, Nabil Muhasin. Muhasin, yes. Muhasin, thank you. Lee Pullum? Yes. Pam Richmond's not with us. <clears throat> Brian Sanders? Yes. Christopher Smith? Smith, excuse me. Rachel Jaranella for oh. Chris Smith, yes. Ramon Sinrorans. Yes. Chad Smith. Nay, no. Kimberly, okay, she's not here. Charlie Wetzel. Yes. Okay. I have 22 yeas and one no. So with 22 yay, one no, motion passes. We'll now move on to item C, which is the approval of the recommendation of the signal retiming ad hoc committee. This was a committee that was pulled together from the last meeting. Mr. Hill will be presenting the information. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Hill. Okay. 
So uh, at our last meeting, we were looking for volunteers to serve on a selection committee for our retiming, uh, updating our retiming contract. And at that time, uh, Mr. Wetzel from Seminole County uh, requested that we consider just allocating funds to the jurisdictions to do the retiming. Um, the uh, subsequent discussion at that meeting uh, led us to develop a ad hoc committee to review this matter. Uh, the, meet, the committee did meet on March the 24th. Members on the committee included Charlie Wetzel, Hazem Alazar, Alex Laffey, uh, and Bonnie, Steve Crowd, and Butch McGrath. Uh, at the meeting, um, and Mr. Wetzel uh, was, was, was very kind to us, um, but we had some discussion and it was agreed, it was consensus that we continue with uh, the status quo of our retiming pro program. And that is uh, that Metro Plan Orlando managed the contracts. Um, and with that, unless any of the other committee members have something to add that I've omitted, uh, our recommendation is just to move forward with uh, our status quo uh, arrangement for managing this project. And that is uh, under the management of Metro Plan Orlando. Let me first ask if there's any comments from the committee members and please raise your hand, but from the ad hoc committee. Give just a moment. And not seeing any raised hands, we'll go ahead and open it to anybody with questions. Again, please raise your hand. And I am not seeing any hands raised. Just as a reminder, before we do the vote, please don't forget to unmute yourself. So I will ask if we have a motion, please state your motion and also your name. Motion to approve Hazem al -Assar. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second, Nabil Mohaizen. Thank you. Any further discussion? With that, we'll go ahead and take the vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. So now we move on to item D, which is the approval of traffic signal retiming task force. Our next action is the approval of the retiming task force. Staff is requesting the formation and the approval of this task force from committee members to assist in the procurement and the management of the new traffic signal retiming contract. Mr. Hill, anything you would like to add? Yes, um, this is um, the group that we want to assemble to help us with selecting consultants as well as managing the contract. Um, and what we're looking for is uh, volunteers from the committee uh, to serve on this committee. Uh, let me also add that uh, the last time we did this, we had uh, each county represented with the city of Orlando. So I don't know if the committee would like to stay with that format or not. Any discussion before we ask for volunteers or any questions? Not seeing any raised hands, I will now ask volunteers if you will please raise your hands. I'm seeing Charlie Wetzel, Ozzie Elisar, Alex Laffey, Scott Brown. Do we have any others? Yeah, I would like to volunteer Mark Tobin, who is my alternate uh, city of work to represent the city of Orlando. <clears throat> and anyone else? And hey, Mr. Chairman, just clarification on Bennett, Benton's comment. Uh, so you're nominating uh, Mark Tobin for the city of Orlando. You're not volunteering, correct? Correct. Mark will represent the city. Okay. And that's, oh, Butch has also raised his hand, Butch McGrath. So I'm seeing Charlie Wetzel, Awesome Alisar, Alex Laffey, Scott Brown, uh, Ben Bonney with his representative, and Butch McGrath. With that, I will go ahead and ask the committee, just a second, so I can lower the hands. That way it's clear. Uh, 
Okay. Now we're going to go ahead and call for a motion. Uh, please don't forget to unmute. And we need a motion along with your name. Motion to approve, Hazem Asar. Thank you. Do we have a second? Thank you, Chad Smith. Second. Eric Chad Smith has a second. So any further discussion? All in favor of this recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And hearing none, motion passes. Thank you so much to our volunteers. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, yes, sir. Uh, we uh, plan to have a coordination session uh, with the members of the committee. Uh, so uh, anticipate getting some correspondence from Laura Rauch, who will be managing the contract. And this is an open invitation to everyone on the committee to just talk about this uh, sick traffic signal retiming. Uh, we've been doing this for a number of years now. And while everything has worked well, uh, it's been an effective project. Um, we want to see what we can do to help evolve this process and see how we can get more value out of our traffic signal retiming program, not just on the, the movement of vehicles, but on the operations of the traffic signal the coordination uh, and other benefits that come along with uh, this project. So anticipate getting some um, correspondence from Laura on this, on this subject. Thank you. Thank you. We are now moving into the presentation part of our agenda. We have two presentations today. As with action items, please raise your hand function to be recognized if you want to ask a question. You may raise your hand during the presentation to indicate that you would like to ask a question, but we will hold all questions until the presentation has concluded. You may also submit your questions via the chat button at the bottom of the window throughout the presentation. The moderator will then relay your questions at the end. So our first presentation is a presentation on connected and automated vehicle training by Simone Fab, software solutions engineer with Metric Engineering. Ms. Fab with Metrics uh, Engineering will give a presentation on the connected and automated vehicle training that will be used in workforce training and development for this emerging technology. Ms. Fab. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, to present to you today. As um, the chairman said, my name is Simone Babb. Um, I am the software solutions manager with Metric Engineering. Also on the line with me, I wanted to recognize um, our Eric Willens and Demetrius Lewis with Metric. Um, Eric is our systems integrator. He's also heavily involved with the whole connected vehicle testing and efforts that we're undertaking with me. And Demetrius is the director of our technology department who also include the connected vehicle program we're involved with. So just a brief overview of who we are. Metric is a full service engineering firm. We specialize in transportation engineering efforts and services um, related to design, structural efforts, roadway, CEI, ITS, GIS, which is my specialty and connected vehicles all throughout the state of, of Florida and Puerto Rico. Um, with that, this presentation today will cover a little bit of the connected vehicle efforts and our involvement in Florida. And um, I do wanna take this time to say a special thank you to both Eric, Hill and Laura for inviting us today. You know, Metric is very appreciative, appreciative of this opportunity. Um, I have my coffee in hand, and I see that uh, a few of you guys have as well, because I'm about to share a lot of information. It's exciting and wonderful, and we'll move on from there. All right, did it change? So as an overview of what I'm going to discuss, first I'll start off with defining you know, what CV entails, describing the environment to include all of the hardware and software components, and then I'll get into a little bit of the individual projects themselves. Um, when we look at connected vehicles and what that means, we see that it refers to the applications and all of the technologies that connect a vehicle to its surroundings, the infrastructure out of the road. And it enables the vehicles themselves and this infrastructure, mobile devices, tablets, um, to all communicate safety information to you um, as a motorist or as a pedestrian, all in this wireless environment. So that means that safety information gets to you quick, quicker and more effectively. So there are a few critical components when you look at this technology itself. There are hardware pieces, for example, the radios. These radios are used to broadcast and receive information. And I will show you a few of these on the next couple of slides. Then there's a huge software component which drives 
the actual broadcasting and allows for the overall TV message transmitted on sensitive devices themselves so, so that you as the recipient can receive the information. There's also a huge uh, testing component involved with this technology. And this is for the purpose of ensuring that these devices work as they say they're, they're supposed to work. Because oftentimes we found that uh, the vendors who, who prepare these devices and offer it to you say it can do one thing versus another, but then when you test it, you find problems. The overall goal of today's uh, presentation is to give you an insight as to what's all involved as far as efforts from a planning stage, the design stage, to all implementation, and as uh, operational stages. So everything is moving towards this digital world, this digital age, right? So everyone is looking to become an overall smart city, taking advantage of all the technology that's available to them. So this slide is intended to show you essentially where CD puts its mark in this environment. So you can stand back and look at what a CD environment for a smart city environment looks like. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it's just to show you that CV is, is a component within this, within this opportunity. So from a hardware perspective, and without getting too technical, um, I'm not sure what your level of understanding is, but I want to you know, embrace it and embrace this and explain this to you. So that way, moving forward, you know what I'm talking about. Um, these are the hardware types that are deployed in a CD world, and they're essential. So the top right image is an RSU, what you see there with the four antennas. This device is mounted out of the infrastructure, the roads, the poles, and it communicates to the on-passing vehicles via the OBUs, which, are, which is in the vehicle itself, and that's the image to the top left. These devices communicate in the 5.9 gigahertz um, band using dedicated short-range communication or cellular technology. Um, they're used on the receiver end, the OBUs, and they communicate with the RSUs transmitting and receiving these messages, like a two-way communication. And this is how you receive the messages. So partnered with this, we have something called the human machine interface, an HMI or a tablet. And this is where you'll be able to see the messages translated, right, between what's occurring out of the roads, the traffic signals, in a more user-friendly environment. Um, these, what you see to the middle, the middle left, is an image of what we call an integrated B2I prototype. This is a hub. Um, it allows for the processing uh, of the messages out at the edge. These are the three major components that make up the, the CD uh, hardware. And then we have some devices out there in the CD world that interact with these devices, and that all depends um, what the applications you're trying to deploy and the intent of the use cases. One of those devices that you see at the bottom left, right is a thermal imaging camera. You could also use a light detection and ranging device, LIDAR. These, these are the actual sensors that you mount at the roads or up on the poles as well, and it detects the pedestrian movement at an intersection. Right? It tracks the pedestrian trajectories. And what this does, and the purpose of this, a huge benefit is it provides for that passive pedestrian detection opportunity so that the pedestrians themselves won't have to walk up and push that pedestrian button for a pet call to change the signal. So if you know, these are just some examples of some sensors and devices that complement the CD environment. So next we have the software component. What I'm showing there are two different objectives or perspectives. The first, when you look at the CV applications and how you are able to receive messages from these devices, that's a huge software component. So for example, when you're looking at um, the signal phase and timing information, right? How do you receive that messages, those messages and an ability that you are able to, to comprehend what they mean? For example, how do you see basic safety messages such as, such as a power collision warning or you know, incidents ahead? Those are all driven by software. And then secondly, we have the central management software uh, side of things or the dashboard. This essentially uh, facilitates how the devices are managed um, on the back end and how the devices themselves get configured. And you can use this dashboard as well to check um, uh, device health. And if something goes wrong, you know where it is, um, as well as to perform updates from one central location. It also allows you to see and manage the frequency of data coming in and also allows you to perform filters of data that you want to see coming in. So there are many different pieces of this that are built into the device management software as well. So I'm going to drive a little bit into um, what's going on, particularly in Florida. And what I'm showing there, the top left image, that's a high level map that was published by the US DOT some time ago. But it's a little outdated, but it shows that, you know, you, you see perspective from all the different um, projects that are occurring within the state itself, all the little dots on the map. But when I say outdated, I mean, some of the projects might have been moved off from project planning stages to design or implementation and on operations. And the cluster of images to the right, um, these are the projects I'm gonna be actually talking to you about today. And particularly what metric 
and my team have been involved with. You see three bubbles to the top right there. Those are actually representative of uh, four different projects that I'm about to explain. These are the four. We have four huge efforts within Florida right now, the D5 I-75 frame. Uh, the Florida's Regional Advanced Mobility Elements is what frame stands for. Then we are involved with efforts in coordination with the Florida Student Bike Enterprise, who's also on the line. Um, then we're working with D1 with the US-41 frame and a CV pilot along US-98. And then also we have the I-4 frame, and that includes D1, D5, and D7. So first looking at the Interstate 75 frame objectives, and this is one of the first projects that um, I've been involved with for some time now because there was a huge initial testing objective with us moving into the construction phase. This uh, project spans across two different counties. We have uh, Marion and Sumter, and it, uh, it, it's, a, its objective is to deploy RSUs, 104 of them along I-75 and a couple of arterials in that vicinity. The goal of this deployment is to improve safety and mobility. And what we've found in, in a lot of the, uh, the CV pilots around the United States or around the world, the objectives here would be to improve safety and mobility. Um, in addition to deploying CV technology, this project looks at signal performance measures as well. It also includes um, deploying several CV applications. I'm going to describe what these are um, because a lot of the uh, agencies are actually deploying the same type of applications, so that way you can benefit from this. And also you will see when I describe what, um, what these applications mean, how they benefit to you as a motorist. So looking at SPAT, signal phase and timing, that's the first one. Here you will see on your HMI or on your OBU, especially when this technology gets embedded into your vehicles in the coming years, you'll be able to see phase countdowns. All right, so what that means is where in relation to if you were to look up at the signal, is your dash being able to tell you that so you don't have to look up. So you better, able, better be able to listen because there could be audible components as well. Where that is, so that way you have more time as well to react and drive off, right? Then there is a map message. And that's, this is essentially what, what it says. It's a map of, or it's a definition, and a main configuration type of message that defines where you are on the roadway. So the system needs to know where you are on the road, right? So it needs to tell you, okay, you need to get over because you're on the left lane and there's an incident ahead. So that's one, one example. Also complementing this is a, a traveler information message also called TIM. And this gives you information such as speed advisories, um, anything related to wet, weather. In some cases, there's snow, snow storms up uh, north. So as you're driving or based on the speed, you can get these advisories, construction ahead, um, incident ahead. So it warns you, right, as a motorist, so that you're better informed to make these decisions as you're driving. And then we have transit signal priority and emergency vehicle preemption. So this actually allows preemption for the um, emergency vehicles and gives them those opportunities. So, the best, so they are able to respond better in terms of incident, changing the signal, and it also reduces the collisions involving, you know, these emergency vehicles as they're moving through the intersection. So as far as the project status of uh, the I-75 frame, construction is uh, planned for later this year. Um, I wanna go a little bit into the um, details of what was all involved with the I-75 frame project. This, this project is, um, was undertaken by Jeremy Dillmore at District 5 and his team. So we started the overall project um, in coordinating with the various device vendors and testing about a year and a half or two years ago, Eric and I at the lab. You know, there was a partnership formed with Seminole County government and District 5 to create what is known as the Seminole County Lab. And this is where we would, you know, lay out all the devices, you know, get the vendors on the phone, do some recordings, uh, put the antennas on the devices and test um, interoperability between, you know, is the, is the RSU able to communicate with, from one vendor, able to communicate from the OBU, which is the vehicle side of things, from another, another vendor. So there were so many different combinations of testing, if you can imagine, right, with these different devices and these different vendors. And then we also had to hook these devices up to the traffic signal controls. And we probably tested about five or six of them. Because as you're moving through counties, you're not just working with what one type of uh, traffic signal control within one cabinet. So we were able to test and create a matrix so that way we could document all these variables and keep it a little bit more manageable um, from what we tested. We created a significant amount of reports as well. We made all of that information available on the web so that way we can share experiences with other agencies, you know, uh, and also gives the vendors an, an opportunity to see, you know, this is what your device was tested against. This is what passed. This is what failed. This is what they can um, improve on. And it also gives them an opportunity as well to better themselves. 
So in addition to testing at the lab, we looked at um, these devices. We took them out and we mounted at the live intersection, two of them, um, one in Orange County and one in Seminole County, close to the UCF area. We mounted them on the poles and we connected them to the traffic signals. Um, we also mounted the OBU part of it, right, in the vehicle, and we mounted up the HMI to see when we're driving what, what exactly we're receiving. Um, we want to see if, uh, if what, we're, what is happening out of the roads is occurring instantaneously and how that, those devices are able to communicate. So that's where we are. Um, we're actively involved right now um, in implementing the security credential management system and assigning security certificates to these devices, and that's a huge um, component. So this exercise, simply defined, will be able to detect um, whether a device um, belongs in that area uh, by authentication. All right, so next is um, the other project is the Florida Turnpikes Enterprise, and they took a different approach and a strategy as part of their CD readiness assessment. Um, and I'll describe this on the next few slides, uh, but, but this is the project information that you're seeing. So their CV pilot is along two of their facilities located in Orange County. The first is along State Route 528, um, what you'll see there in orange. And that goes from I-4 to about the McCoy Road area, and that's about eight, eight miles. And then the second project, what you see is the blue line, and that's State Road 98 from south of the uh, beach line. So just a block of 408, and that's 12 miles, totaling 20 miles for those two projects. And what they want to see and test is the effectiveness of the CB technology against these devices, the RSUs and the OBUs. So they will be testing map, um, traveler information messages. They don't obviously have uh, signal phase and timing because these are limited access, access freeways, right? But alternatively, they'll be testing applications such as wrong way driving and curve speed warning applications. Design has begun. Um, construction is yet to be determined. And the Turnpike as well also has interest in testing this technology as we move into later on of design phases. All right, so when I mentioned um, the strategy that the Turnpike took, this is what I mean. So FTE did uh, their CB assessment in three different phases. Phase one including, included metric, um, identifying other similar uh, connected vehicle type deployments throughout the United States. And this also included, included taking a look at um, other tooling agencies. And the purpose of this was to identify what other agencies or what their pilot motivators were, you know, how they set up their CB pilots, to understand the steps that they took and to identify their lessons learned. We created an interview process where we reached out to about 12 agencies and they shared those experiences with us. All of the information we gathered, um, to, we provided to, FTE, to the FTE sorry, to be used as lessons learned and to better, better plan their project as they move ahead you know, when looking at infrastructural communication, you know, staffing, what type of partnerships, hardware and software solutions. And that's, it's a sneak peek of what they were to move forward to in phase, phase two. All right, so moving forward with what they accomplished in phase two, this task really took a detailed look at their existing conditions and their um, operational readiness for a CV deployment. So we went ahead and identified their roadside infrastructure and their communication infrastructure and determined that, you know, to some extent, the communication infrastructure was, was um, we offered recommendations from that, but their roadside infrastructure was adequate. So we documented all of that and provided it to them as they moved forward to planning. We also came up with a CV training plan. Now, with regards to their staffing, we identified you know, what they needed as far as staffing, looking at it from what, what, how staffing could be fulfilled from phasing, right? Phases throughout the different stages of this project. So for example, we identified what staff you needed as far as the planning stage, you know, the implementation, the design, anything as far as software development or testing. As well, we said, hey, this is the level of education that for each one of those phases that have been identified, you need to have, right? And there are opportunities out there as far as trainings and certification. And at the conclusion of this um, task two and, and training plan for the Turnpike, we identified some strong, and the Turnpike also agreed that there was some strong need for um, staff training in a few areas, such as, okay, they need professional training. They want to understand see the device and specifications, that, tech, that technology um, component and technical component, some equipment testing. They need um, training in software and software development and cybersecurity. So just a few of the areas that we wanted to highlight uh, bottom left. Um, what we learned from this interview age, uh, from interviewing these different agencies throughout the U.S. is that there's a huge gap in knowledge because the technology is so new and that a lot of the agencies relied heavily on 
you know, support from the actual device vendors themselves or their consultants. And they rely heavily as well on the academia, right, to, to help manage some of that data coming in. And then came their final task, task three. And that's where, from all the lessons learned, and we came up with a ready deploy CD um, deployment. And this is where the two project locations that I showed you earlier were identified by the FinTech staff. We really needed to identify a real case scenario for a CD deployment. We couldn't just go out and think about it from a holistic approach and say, let's just deploy it along these two, right? We needed to identify a real world solution for a real, real world uh, implication of a problem. So we looked at real data. We pulled in crash data from Signal 4 and SunGuy from the DOT. And the Turnpike also provided us with data because we asked them, hey, if we're going to look at curb speed, and we know this is a real practical solution, give us some data where wrong where drivers are occurring and also where you have ramp-related incidents. So we got that data and we were able to identify specific locations along these segments where the CD technology could be benefited. And then another project that we're involved with is the US 41 frame um, for District 1. This project is, has the same goals of uh, mobility and safety elements identified, like as I've explained before. But the goal here is to deploy about 70 or 71 um, RSUs at these intersections that you see on the map. Um, looking at the same um, applications for safety, but here they particularly have an interest in deploying passive pedestrian safety, right? So those devices that you mount that are able to detect and uh, act on the uh, behalf of the pedestrians. So prior to this, uh, deploying and selecting what's going to be placed along these 71 intersections at, U at US 41, they want to do some testing of the RSUs and OVUs, right? So they're actually going to deploy for some time out at US 98, which is close to their headquarters, so that they can monitor how these devices are. So to support District 1, we reached out to several device uh, vendors and expressed interest in testing their systems for District 1. And of course, they wanted to showcase their skills and device capabilities, so they all agreed to lend us their, their um, devices. And based on how these devices perform, and if District 1 is pleased, they'll make a determination on what they want to use for, for the deployment of the 41 frame project. We expect this project to be kicked off soon as far as the testing. So we also undertook as part of this project some research and vendor demonstrations where they were able to hands-on touch devices in some cases and understand what they're capable of as far as functionality. And we did um, this in, the, in, in a form of an alternatives analysis report. And that report essentially looked at communication technologies from the vehicle to the infrastructure or from how it interacts with vehicle to vehicle opportunities and where passive pedestrian detection systems fall in. It also talks about the communication architecture, how much these devices cost and any other information that might be important for the district as they look to secure these devices and implement it into their last stage. So metric as part of uh, this task as their systems manager is to determine the optimal locations for where these devices will be placed. So the images to the bottom left and the top right. This is a depiction of the proposed four CV test locations to supplement the US 41 ultimate project, right? So District 1 is essentially has identified four locations and two of them will be equipped with passive pedestrian detection um, devices to test these and to see how the data is coming in and how, the, how it's all being managed. So again, based on the analytics and the performance of these test devices, the district will determine what will be used as part of the uh, 41 project. Next is the I-4 frame project. It's the last but not the least. Um, we are the systems manager for this as well. This project will also evaluate CD technology, but along I-4 and other arterials within four different districts. That's D1, D5, D7, and the FinPike District 8. The goal would be to implement the CD technology and the uh, ATSPM, the automated signal performance metrics, for improving, again, safety and mobility, all right, and improving the signal functionality. This, this uh, technology will also evaluate the SPAP, MAP, TIM, um, ATSPM. So when we look at um, connected vehicles and what the, the overall benefits are, there's a focus that everyone mentions, right? And that's safety and mobility. We see that smart mobility and pedestrian safety um, are available as benefits as well. And because of the ability to receive these messages instantaneously in your vehicles, you know, whether it's the speed advisories, diversions, or a pedestrian in the area, this is something that we say can contribute to the reduction in a number of incidents. And whether the vehicle to vehicle um, is a vehicle to pedestrian and pedestrian to the vehicle are able to communicate those messages quick enough so that they can get out of the way. So there are also other benefits such as you know a lot of data. We've heard of um, big data and the management of this big data. And the benefits of that is that the uh, government can use this information that they collect over time with any given area. And they could use to track the trends, 
right? And develop um, understandings of what's happening where. And that all leads to the benefits of advisories and how they move forward in the future um, as an extension of the safety to you as the motorist or the pedestrian. And then other um, intangible uh, benefits would be the huge um, impact and mitigation with environmental, especially when you're looking forward with um, the next phase of the autonomous, all right? Reduction in emissions, looking at, um, you know, reduction in the, fuel of, in the fuel consumption. And you already see out there some level of autonomous um, components such as um, driver assist and self-parking opportunities. So if you could take that and imagine that out a few years from now, there are a lot of benefits that can be derived from this. But overall, the quality of life improves. So this slide, um, although this technology is new, there are a lot of opportunities for training and um, webinars provided by the USDOT out there that you can get involved and really try to understand this, especially as, a, especially as agencies really need to know what all the components are, right, to get involved with a CD or how to deploy a CD environment. Uh, myself and um, Eric, Eric Willens with our firm, went through this, or this formal CV professional training um, program with a company called The Next Education. It's, it's essentially listed as a four-day online, but you can move through this quickly with them. And if the professor sees that you're advancing quickly and understand this, it could probably be trimmed down to about three days, but it's, it's online. And it it's, uh, discusses topics related to software, hardware, communication, and standards. And standards are a big thing. And, um, and at the end, you'll feel better, right, with, with knowing how, how to move forward with uh, CD technology, at least get involved. Um, at the end, we got official professional certification training and a, a nice certificate that we could um, put up on our walls. But education and experience to me really um, play, uh, comes as you play with these devices themselves. So no amount of education that you can read online really puts it into perspective without touching and interacting with these devices, coordinating with the vendor, seeing the pros, the cons, seeing what doesn't work. That's really where the true you know, benefit comes in um, from knowing how these devices interact. So I am sorry if I took too much time here. I really want to think I'm so passionate about this, right? So I hope this was um, educational to you. And again, I appreciate the opportunity. And if there are any questions, myself and my team are on the line. Thank you very much. Uh, would like to ask committee members if you have questions to raise your hands so that we can go ahead and call on you. And the first one I have is Charlie Wetzel. Charlie. Yeah, late last year, um, we had an issue turning on some of our um, DSRCs due to the FCC licensing and the, you know, their desire to restrict kind of the 5.9 band. Is, do you have any update on that? Is there any hurdles still with trying to turn those devices on? So there is still um, conversations going on um, with this because of the boundary assignments and they will still be looking at um, those opportunities. There's not been any decisions yet. For the district projects, though, they're looking at the CD Select technology versus the DSRC. So it's still in limbo. Yeah, Charlie, as far as the, um, the FCC goes, uh, we still haven't really had a uh, concrete answer on that. I know due to the outbreak that uh, they, they temporarily did give that lower half to um, Wi-Fi right now. So I'd imagine that we should get some kind of answer here uh, rather soon within the next month or two uh, because Departments and agencies need to know what they what they're going to do with DSRC um, or CB2X. So they, I, I, I'm assuming it's going to come real soon. This, this answer. A lot of agencies are really just waiting, you know, because they have these devices. But you can put it up; you just can't turn it on. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And the next I show is Brian. And for the sake of time, I'm going to ask this, this be our last question. But go ahead, Brian. Good morning, Simone. Thanks for the presentation, first of all. Great job. A um, couple of questions. One, of all the projects that you presented on, are they all using the same approach in terms of using an IVP hub mm -hmm. processing component? And then the second part of my question on another subject is, how much have you been able to work with CB2X? Like, have you been able okay. to get radios in hand? How, how much work yes. have you done? Yeah. All right. To, so uh, let me let me let me get it, and then I would ask you if I miss anything to fill in, fill in as well. So with regards to your first question and the projects using this hub, because you know the purpose of this hub is it's essentially the same thing as the RSUs, right? But it allows for a little bit more expandability as you're looking to implement based on the use cases 
different devices, those different ports that are available. It also has that processing power, all right? So the data doesn't have to go back. It could be done at the edge faster. Um, the only, the, so we tested that as part of the D5 project. The I-75 frame, however, doesn't use that, okay? I'm not sure what's gonna happen as far as the future and the implementation is that as they scale those needs up. Now, as far as D1 for the I-4 frame, we are going to be putting those devices, two of them up um, for testing. And based on the needs, they may look, or the cost, or any other objectives um, identified by the district, they may deploy that along uh, 41 frame. So I'm not really sure as far as what their decision is yet. We really haven't seen these devices really true action out of the deployment besides Cisco. Now, you do know that Cisco did use this out of the state of 50 to 20 several months um, for those creating sessions. That's where they use that connected to the, um, the LiDAR devices and was able to really handle the processing of that. Taking a step back, Simone, how, how like throughout the presentation, how much, how, how much, how common of an approach is that? Are, are other agencies, other states using this same type of approach? Is District 5 sort of leading? No, they, they were able to, like, uh, for example, one of the devices and vendors was able to deploy this out at Ohio, right, to really manage these devices and connect to, um, for any sorts of warnings with, with regards to con um, construction zones. So they were able to deploy this um, outside of Florida as well. So we're at the stage right now where we're just testing that technology. It's not been- If I, could, uh, if I could jump in, Brian, to answer your- And if we question. can just wrap up real quick, go ahead and jump in. But I wanna make sure I get the next speaker also. So go ahead. Sure. Yeah, Brian, just to answer, go back to your CB2X. Um, I-75 frame will be one of the first projects in the state of Florida to use um, CB2X technology. It's 104 units. We're actually kind of excited. We have um, RSUs that are dual, dual bands. They can do both DSRC and CB2X. But the way things are going, we're thinking it's going to be CB2X. So it's going to be probably the largest deployment of CB2X radios um, in, the, in the state of Florida for sure. And we have seen the functionality of this, um, I would say, last year. Yeah, um, we, where we, we were able to communicate, Where we were able to communicate direct uh, P PC5 communication between one vehicle and another through CB um, cellular technology. We were able to see that. So okay. we, thank we you have very to answer much. any other questions offline. All right, thank you very much. That was very thank informative. You. So thanks for joining us this morning. Our next presentation is on the Intelligence Society, Transportation Society of Florida by Mr. Pete Costello, President and Chairman of ITS Florida. Mr. Costello uh, will provide an overview of the organization, a perspective on the current state of technology in transportation opportunities for the TISMO committee members to participate within this organization. Mr. Costello, we've got about 15 minutes and you're on. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee and Metroplan staff for this opportunity to share the work of ITS Florida with the committee. Um, I'm joined on the board of directors. We uh, try to meet monthly. Uh, before the coronavirus, uh, every quarter we tried to meet somewhere around the state. Uh, but uh, here are the folks that are on the board uh, and the officers, uh, Jim Clark is our past president, uh, myself and Craig Carnes is the vice president, Pete Gancy is secretary, uh, Rob Price uh, is treasurer, and then directors are Russell Allen, uh, Drew Young, Jeremy Huffman, uh, Dr. Agarwal, and uh, Terry Hensley. Uh, we have a long history. Um, we were founded in 1992. We were the first uh, formal uh, ITS state chapter organization, and we became affiliated with ITS America in 1994, although back then I think it was IVHS America, the Intelligent Vehicle Highway uh, System, uh, you know, Society of America. Uh, goals of our organization, uh, we try to advocate on behalf of our members. We do a lot of uh, information exchange. Uh, we partner with other associations, uh, transportation associations around the state and in the southeast uh, region of the United States. Uh, we're trying to develop and expand uh, ITS markets uh, and provide opportunities about those markets with our members. Uh, we're all about planning, implementing, and operating ITS. So Simone's presentation, you know, I reflected back on, I used to be at ITS America 20 uh, some years ago, and all the things we've been talking about for so long are coming to fruition. So it, it's great to see. Uh, we collaborate amongst stakeholders like yourselves uh, here in the state. We also 
uh, when needed, the department uh, asks uh, ITS Florida for advice about the ITS TISMO program here in the state. Uh, one of my goals as uh, president this year is to focus in on workforce development. Um, Simone mentioned, you know, there's a lot of degrees and things needed and uh, CV professional training is all sorts of additional training that can uh, be taken place and, and, and develop our workforce for these new technologies that we're talking about. We have a whole seri series of education op educational opportunities. We do a number of lunch and learn webinars. Our, our most recent one was uh, last month. Uh, Dr. Raj Polinori from Central Office shared the high level, uh, not the detail that Simone did, but the high level connected automated vehicle program uh, across the state. Uh, we're always looking for additional presentations. Uh, we work with Dr. Hadi from FIU. Uh, he chairs uh, our lunch and learn committee. So if you have an idea, you can reach out uh, to Dr. Hadi, myself as well, and, and my contact info will be later. Uh, we have a technical committee uh, that kind of focuses on, um, you know, some of those uh, technology issues that Simone was talking about and what we see in testing and things like that. We bring that up to the department and the department shares what uh, what's going on with uh, the Turl, the, the research lab up in Tallahassee, and um, some of the work that they're doing and products that are going on the APL and things like that. Uh, we focus a lot on scholarships. I have a slide on that. Uh, I mentioned our regional meetings both around the state and uh, across the Southeast uh, United States. Right now we're planning a meeting in 2022 uh, for uh, all the chap chap state chapters in the Southeastern US. Uh, ITS Georgia is leading that and uh, they'll be hosting that in Atlanta. It's similar to the 5C conference that we had in 2018 back in, uh, in Jacksonville. And we provide PDH uh, for our members that need that. Uh, how we communicate with our members, we have a website. Uh, there's the URL, itsflorida.org. Uh, all our information is there. Uh, what's happening with the technical committee. We have newsletters that we go out and, and push information. Uh, we also provide information to the department uh, for the disseminator. So we, we put information in that as well. Uh, one of our highlights is every year we do a calendar uh, so this is an image of our 2020 calendar. You may see this in some of the district offices and uh, some of our members offices around the state. We also sent this to the legislature. So every, every member up in the legislature got this so uh, they, they can be apprised of some of the things that are going on uh, in ITS across the state. Uh, we're asking for photos submission. So the deadline is in July. So if you have any photos of your projects uh, that you'd like to implement, that have been implemented, that you'd like to include, uh, we can take that and, and, and look to put that in the 2021 calendar. Uh, our membership, as you saw from the board of directors, uh, is diverse uh, public sector agencies, engineers, consultants, uh, universities, vendors. And then these are the organizations across the state that we coordinate with. We have reciprocal memberships with uh, the Puerto Rico, Florida, Puerto Rico section of ITE. Team Florida, Floridians for uh, Better Transportation, and the uh, Florida Transportation Builders Association. Uh, mentioned the scholarships, and um, it's always interesting to see these uh, ladies, uh, but we have memorial scholarships uh, that we award annually uh, for District 5's Ann Brewer. Um, for those of you um, that re recall, Ann led uh, the iFlorida ITS model deployment that was a, a very big program uh, a number of years back. Uh, the scholarship in her name is for students that are going after their bachelor degree or, or their graduate degrees and it provides a stipend up to $2,500 uh, to, to those students. Uh, for Ed Erica Reidelhoover Verosac scholarship, uh, Erica was very instrumental at ITS Florida, the, the Southeast region um, uh, meeting that I mentioned, she started that with uh, the 3C, I think it was, with uh, the Gulf region a number of years ago, and she also started a calendar. So uh, we memorialize her with um, folks that want to get industry training. So you or your staff uh, that want to do training, like Simone mentioned, that CV professional, if you want to get that, ITS Florida could uh, offer a scholarship for that for you or for your staff to, to get that uh, kind of designation or, or any industry training. Uh, mentioned ITS America, we partner with them 
Uh, as far as I know, the ITS World Congress in Los Angeles in October is still uh, going on as planned. We'll see you know, what the impact is there. But uh, again, with our workforce development and, and looking to the future, um, they have an emerging leaders program as part of that um, Congress's um, uh, program. And we've sponsored three high schools uh, here in Florida that are doing an AV robotics cha challenge. So uh, very interesting to see reports coming out of Miami Coral Park High School and what they're doing. Uh, obviously with what happened a month ago, um, some of these kind of, you know, getting the students together has been derailed a little bit, but we're sponsoring them as well as Sebring High School and, and South Aid Senior High in, in Homestead uh, to, to do this uh, robotics AV challenge. We also recognize our members uh, with a number of awards, member of the year, professional of the year. Uh, the president can uh, you know, award uh, something. So we'll see if I, I do something on that this year. Uh, we recognize an ITS champion. Uh, for those uh, that co contributed to the industry that we lose in, in you know, the course of a year, we add them to the ITS Florida honor roll. Uh, and then we also have some certificates of outstanding achievement. Uh, and then this year as part of um, my uh, focus on workforce development, we're gonna recognize uh, across the state, a, a road ranger, a TMC operator, and an ITS maintainer of the year, kind of to get those people exposed to the work of, of this organization. And just a little flashback uh, in, in 2017, uh, Jeremy Dilmore uh, in District 5 was re recognized as a professional of the year. Uh, and in 2017, Tushar Patel received one of these uh, outstanding achievement awards and then last year in 2019, District 5 for the new RTMC, they received um, the, the uh, uh, excuse me, outstanding achievement. Uh, the, the chapter itself has received a number of awards from ITS America as the best chapter and outstanding chapter over the, the years. We've, we've done great work that's recognized across the, the country. Uh, we have an upcoming event that we are planning again, moving forward. Uh, October 11th through the 14th in Bonita Springs with the Florida Puerto Rico uh, ITE section uh, in Bonita Springs, uh, our Transpo 2020. Uh, we have a registration and call for abstracts coming soon. And um, the theme is 2020 roaring towards the future, uh, kind of a flashback to the roaring 20s. We'll see what happens after all this COVID if we hopefully will have a, another roaring 20s uh, decade here. Um, so if you want to participate, um, you can log on to our website. Please consider becoming a member. Uh, if you want to share the good work that you're doing, uh, we, we'd be happy to do that at Lunch and Learn. Or if you want to make a presentation at Transpo 2020, uh, please contact myself or Sandy Beck. Uh, she's our paid staff that uh, works with ITS Florida. Uh, th that's the conclusion of my comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Pete. Uh, we are running low on time, so unfortunately, yes, I'm going to limit the uh, questions. But Pete has his contact information up there, pfc at iterus.com. So I do recommend that you contact him with any questions. Thank uh, you. Would, thank you so much, sir. Would like to point out that we do have common presentations with the TAC. That will not be on this specific platform, so you will need to sign out and then re-sign in and the TAC meeting. If you are a member of TAC, you've been sent your member link. Otherwise, you can go through the Metro Plan Orlando webpage at metroplanorlando.org slash virtual meetings to log in. So with that, I thank everybody for our first virtual meeting. Give you a moment to go ahead and get your virtual coffee out in the virtual kitchen and then see you at TAC. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, Doug. That concludes Thanks, our meeting. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.